Λοιπόν, πάμε στην επόμενη συνεδρία, την τρίτη, με τίτλο με γενικό θέμα γεωπλαστική σαμαροπία ε, ναυπηγική. Από ό,τι βλέπω εδώ, η πρώτη ανακοίνωση είναι από την κυρία Κριστίν ε, Λάντσεν Γουίλη, η οποία γεννήθηκε στην ε, Θεσσαλονίκη. Ε, ήρθε σε επαφή με την κεραμική, διτεύοντα σε διάφορου παραδοσιακού κεραμίστε στην Σύφνο. Πλήρωσε τι σπουδέ τη στο University of California, στο Santa Cruz, πτυχίο ε, καλών τεχνών, ειδικότητα στην κεραμική. Έχει μεταπτυχιακό από το Διεθνέ Πανεπιστήμιο στη Θεσσαλονίκη, με ειδικότητα στην κεραμική τη Μαύρη Θάλασσα τη Αρχαία Ελλάδα. Μα μιλήσει στα αγγλικά, από ό,τι βλέπω, για την κληρονομιά τη βυζαντινή τέχνη και την επίδρασή τη στην ε, λαϊκή ελληνική τέχνη. Τέλο τη ανακοίνωση. Είναι the legacy of Byzantine ceramic art, how it inspired folk art in Greece. Καλό λοιπόν την κυρία Willis, να ξεκινήσει την ανακοίνωσή τη. Willis, it's your turn. Σα ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Για την πρόσκληση και για την ευκαιρία να μιλήσω σε όλους εσάς στο κοινό για το θέμα αυτό που αγαπάω πάρα πολύ είναι η Βυζαντινή κεραμική στην Ελλάδα αποφάσισα να δώσω την ομιλία μου στα αγγλικά γιατί είναι η μητρική μου γλώσσα οπότε θα μου επιτρέψετε να ελπίζω όλοι να καταλαβαίνετε κάπως ελληνικά Σας μιλώ σήμερα από τη Λακιά ένα μικρό χωριό έξω από τη Θεσσαλονίκη όπου έχω και το εργαστήριό μου My name is Christine Willis, and I'm speaking to you today as a ceramic artist and as a teacher of the ceramic arts for the past 40 years. My topic is the legacy of Byzantine ceramic art and how it has affected folk art in Greece today. But as a teacher, I also want to make a plea for more ceramic art education in the Greek school curriculum. 95% of the people in this audience will recognize that this is a black figure, amphora, made in ancient Greece during the classical period. You know this because you studied it in your history books. You see it in museums throughout Greece and the world. But how many of you can recognize that this plate was made in the late Byzantine period? Most of the clay that was used during the Byzantine era was a local red clay, which was covered with a red slip. This gave the potter the option to decorate his work using a technique called scrafito. And in the next few slides, I will describe for you some of the most common scrafito techniques. Fine scrafito used a very thin tool to etch a design into the plate and then create a filigree pattern within the design, as you see from this plate. Painted scrafito used the same technique of etching a design through the white slip, but then adding color to enhance the design. The most common use of color was green, brown, and yellow, using copper, iron, and rutile oxides. Incised scrafito is very similar to the fine scrafito technique, but has a greater contrast between the thicker and thinner lines. The champlev technique is far more time consuming as a process, as a greater portion of the white slip has to be removed. There is a greater contrast between light and dark. Zefxipos wear was a name given to a discovery of Byzantine ceramics, which were found in the bottom of a well outside of the Palace of Constantinople in 1927. As you can see, it's a combination of incised and painted scrafito techniques. Very often in Byzantine ceramics, we will see animal motifs, lions, deer, birds, and hunting scenes, or sometimes a human sphinx, as in these two plates. 
Most of what we know about Byzantine ceramics have been found in shipwrecks throughout the Aegean and the Mediterranean seas. Ceramic centers were usually located wherever there was a good deposit of local clay that was suitable for making pottery. One of these centers was the island of Sifnos, where I met my first teacher, Mr. Vasily Lukyandon. Mr. Vasily would take his donkey up into the hills to collect his clay, a very labor intensive process. Back in his studio, he would pass it through a sieve and then let it dry until it was just the right consistency to make his work. His studio was located in the tiny hamlet of Faros, right on the beach so that is where it could easily be shipped to large urban centers exactly what potters have been doing throughout the Byzantine Empire. But before pots can be transported, they have to be fired. On the left is a very rare plaque depicting a potter from ancient Greece firing his kiln. On the right is a recently excavated kiln found in Sinope on the southern shores of the Black Sea. With my students and master potter, Yanis Tangidis, we recently built a wood fire kiln in Khakiviki, which could have been used either in classical or Byzantine times. We collected the local red clay, sieved it just as Mr. Vasili did, and then proceeded to make the clay that was used to build the kiln. Once the kiln was dry, Using local wood, we would fire it to roughly 1,000 degrees centigrade. So what happened to Byzantine ceramics in the course of history? Unfortunately, um, imported ware from Italy was thought to be far superior in quality. So the local potters lost their market. New Persian and Iznik pottery was also imported and considered more elegant. And yet Byzantine ceramics continue to inspire us today. How does one pursue a career in folk art? What are the options for learning a trade? Some are born into a family of potters and continue their tradition. Some have an opportunity to apprentice with a master craftsman. There are very few schools throughout Greece that teach pottery. There are very few that are run by either OIF or EEC. My understanding is that there was an EEC school in Volos, but recently closed. And most pottery schools in Greece today are run by the initiative of individuals. In my own case, after working in Sifnos with Mr. Vasili, I wanted to pursue a career in ceramics at the university level. However, this was impossible in Greece. So I chose to go to the United States where I attended the University of California in Santa Cruz and got my Bachelor of Arts in ceramics. The third and final part of my talk shows how Byzantine ceramics have inspired many artists today, starting with Picasso. Panos Balsamaikis was also a well-known ceramic artist from Athens, a contemporary of Picasso. During the slideshow honoring Kitsou Makris, Panos Balsamaikis had sent a letter to Mr. Makris, for those of you who saw it. Minas Avramidis had his workshop in Thessaloniki, and perhaps you can see the similarity in his designs with some of the Byzantine plates that I showed earlier. Iratrian da Filidi was born in Batumi on the shores of the Black Sea and moved to Marusi after 1922. She also used the scafito method and then added color to her designs. The following slides show examples of scafito work from the Potters Association of Northern Greece. I'll read to you some of their names. This is Aliki Karavatu. And you can see how she used the scafito technique, several of the different scafito techniques that I showed you. Thomas Mavrudis, 
say Nikolchu, also using different kinds of color, different clay with the same scrafito technique. Sofia Palambuyuki. You'll see the familiar Byzantine bird on the right. Anthi Sultani, again using the human sphinx, the lion so common in Byzantine ceramics. Vespina Juliaropulu. All of these were etched using this graffito technique that I described earlier. These are some photos of my own work where I also am using scrafito, but also with a lot more color. And this is from an exhibit of my Byzantine plates in the gallery of Mrs. Efi Manole Daiki in Horkiakis. Simos Vardaxis was a wonderful potter and a mentor for me. And shortly before he died, he told me an amazing story that I'd like to share with you. In the 20s and the 30s, when he was still a young man, he was visited quite often by French archaeologists who were looking for authentic Byzantine plates. So he and his brothers used to make exact replicas and bury them outside their studio in a pile of manure. After several months in the acidity of the manure, their plates would look old and weathered, and they could sell them at a higher price as antiques. One day, when he went on a visit to the Louvre Museum in Paris, there was one of his plates that he had made. Even though he had no formal education, he could still fool the French archeologists. So my talk is, about folk art, but also about education. And unless we establish a curriculum of education to support young people today to learn the necessary skills, ceramic art in Greece will slowly die. Thessaloniki was a flourishing pottery center with over 200 studios in the early 1900s. Today, there are less than 10. And as I mentioned earlier, it's mostly private individuals today who teach pottery. My proposal today to the members of this conference is to introduce the ceramic arts into the Greek curriculum. It should be taught at all ages from pre-K to university. We need to begin by teaching the teachers. And as a ceramic artist who has been teaching for the past 40 years, I'm more than happy to help support this initiative. 